recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff. This is Triviality. The cream of the crop. Hello, welcome to Triviality, the game where a lack of seriousness meets just a little tiny, teeny tiny bit Skosh. of knowledge. Just a Scotia knowledge. My name is Ken. I'll be your host today. Um, and across from me is Jeff and Neil. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. New Jonas Brothers album dropped, so oh I'm hyped. Ten was, years in the making. He was listening to it in the car. He, was. Was, trying to, he was trying to put on uh, punk rock to cover it up, but every time uh, the song ended, <laughs> it went back to the Jonas Brothers queue. Yep, it was on the queue of the album, so I was listening to that album, getting hyped. You can't hide from me, Neil. I know I can't. You're right. But uh, we're very excited today. We have a plethora of guests, uh, the first of which is in the studio with us, all the way in from Denver, Colorado. He's an intercontinental champion, so we surely appreciate that. It is Willow Campbell. How's it going, everybody? Good. Thank you for joining us here in the studio. Yeah, happy to be here. It's, uh, it's quite exciting for me. And, and, you came, and you came just for this, I understand. No other purpose in Chicago. Yes, I, uh, I came for uh, five days for one day of trivia. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm, I'm <laughs> quite stoked. And uh, tell us a little bit about your life out there in Denver. Um, well, I'm, uh, you know, it's pretty fun. We're, um, I'm getting ready to um, hopefully release a uh, card game here in the next couple of months. Nice. Um, so, uh, you know, looking forward to it. Yeah. Please let us know about that and we'll, uh, we'll do some, uh, sort of collaboration. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, cool. And next coming to us, uh, over Skype is our United States Patreon supporter all the way from Joplin, Missouri, Tristan Turner. How you doing? I am wonderful. How are you guys doing? Good. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. I know you've been listening for a while and of course you, uh, support us on Patreon. So we appreciate that. And it's a pleasure to finally meet you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you as well. I uh, have been binge listening to you guys on my way to work for oh, probably a month now. <laughs> have you have you learned anything? Absolutely, yeah. No, it's uh, okay. uh, it, it's uh, and that's all you can ask for, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And what do you do out there in Joplin? I uh, am actually a table games dealer for a casino near Joplin. I actually work over in Oklahoma because I'm so close to the border. Very cool. We've had a surprising amount of casino dealers on this show. Two, I, Two, I, was, I think, which is more I than I ever the thought. Same thing. <laughs> I should get into that racket. Maybe. Anyways, we must really be inspiring to the casino crowd. Yeah. <laughs> Lastly, uh, our uh, who's going to be the uh, host today is Joe Wen. He's a cruiserweight champion coming to us from New York City. How you doing, Joe? Good to talk all to right. you again. I'm all right. Great to see you guys too. How you been? Yeah, good. And uh, we all know Joe by this uh, point. I think he's been on the show two or three times, and uh, he was also our teammate at uh, at Geek Bowl. So good to Vegas see you again, Joe. Vegas and Boston. Vegas and Boston, two-time Geek Bowl uh, runner-up. Yep. <laughs> yeah, like Charlie Brown, he is a good man. Thank you very much. Right. Much appreciated. All right. So before we uh, toss it over to the rules guy, let's uh, get our teams assembled here. Uh, I think uh, Neil was going to be teaming up with Willow here in the studio. Is that right? Yeah, Willow said that he knows a little bit about science, which I know nothing about. Uh, and uh, Willow was on the show before, and I'll let him uh, say the team name because he wants to sort of uh, have a little bit of revenge, I guess, right? Yeah, so uh, last time um, Jeff, and, um, Jeff and Neil were uh, mild high. So this is the mild high comeback. Mild, All right. All right. mild high comeback. And uh, Tristan and uh, Jeff are going to be teaming up, so... How about you guys? Yeah, I think in, in honor of uh, where Tristan lives. Uh, Joplin, gonna, Missouri. Joplin, Missouri. Yeah, we're going to be, uh, it's rag time. In honor of Scott Joplin, who <laughs> Joplin, Missouri is probably not named after. <laughs> probably that's, not. That's uh, absolutely right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds good. It's rag time versus mild high comeback. And now let's hear from the rules guy. The rules of the game are simple. 20 questions split into two rounds worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there'll be a special swing round designed by this week's host. After regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. The cream will rise to the top, oh yeah. Nice, uh, nice ragtime version of that. You know, yeah. sort of like the like "Hello, the, my baby." I like the piano in the background. It's nice. Yeah, it's a little entertainer in the background. If kind you didn't of. hear it, make sure to turn it way up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 
And uh, with all that uh, clerical business out of the way, let's toss it over to Joe and get this game started. All right. Question number one. The Battle of Gallipoli was a major military campaign during World War I in what is now what modern-day country? I'm just thinking back to the Mel Gibson movie that yeah, we watched. No, no shit, Neil. I know. I'm trying to remember where they invaded and were slaughtered. Um, I wonder if that would have been a country at that point. Um, that's fine. You guys want to go with that? Sure, we can. Okay, we can I, that does that. sound familiar. So, um, cool. So we'll, we'll we can lock in with that. And let them talk. Yeah, let's do that. All right, Tristan. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I don't know that I'll have anything meaningful to contribute this time. All I can get is Tripoli in my head, and that's in North Africa somewhere. All right. Um, you mind if I just go Algeria then? Because that Absolutely. sounds like I think that's where that's Tripoli fine. is. Okay, we're gonna go with Algeria. Will and I had a some extended conversation, and I'll let Willow take it. Um, yeah. So I um, just the, with the way that it was spelled, I figured it was gonna be more in the uh, uh, like southern side of Europe, and then you know. We we also wrote down a couple uh, African countries and um, but I think we ended up just going with with Italy. All right, guys. Well, uh, a bit the name is a bit misleading because the name is an Italian form of the Greek name meaning beautiful city. Uh, the Gallipoli Peninsula, however, is part of Turkey. Ah. Major military campaign, 1915-1960, Turkey. Which would have been the Ottoman Empire at the time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm. Exactly. Hence the reason he asked for the current country. That's right. That's correct, yep. All right, let's move on to question two. Question number two. First produced by Ludens in 1936, what fashionable-sounding candy bar, now owned by Hershey, consists of peanut butter crunch layers and chocolate similar to Nestle's Butterfinger? The fashionable clue is throwing me off. I'm trying to think of candy bars that are like Butterfinger. Um, and I'm a sweets guy, so this is really getting getting at me. You eat a lot of candy? I eat a lot of candy. Uh, well, I don't, so that's that's hurting me here. Um, but I can't I can't come up with anything better. Okay. Um, I think uh, you just want to lock in with one of them. We'll decide. Yeah, let's go with the the Heath bar. Let's do that. Heath, okay. All right, Tristan. Uh, what are, What are you thinking? Well, I uh, I was also kind of attaching to the uh, fashionable clue as well. The only thing I could think of, um, and I'm not a big candy eater either, so I don't. This might sound silly, but I said like a hundred grand. If you had that, you could afford two Tom Ford suits. <laughs> they, exactly. <laughs> and so. nothing more. Not tailored though. Just off right, the rack. Right off the rack. <laughs> Do they have a rack? No. I don't know if they do. That's probably <laughs> not, yeah. Okay. I don't think a uh, hundred grand has peanut butter in it. Um I'm trying to remember what's in a Charleston chew. Charleston sounds old. Um <laughs> and it was a fashionable dance at one point, so I don't know if that's in a you know too far outside of the, the meaning there. Do you know what's in a Charleston chew? I think it has some sort of like nougat in it, I believe. Uh. Got to have a good nougat. <laughs> I love that phrase, that, that word and candy. It's got a good nougat. Yeah, I'm I mean, I'm cool with that if that's what you want to. If you want Charleston Chew, sure. Let's let's go Charleston Chew. Uh, Will and I talked about it for a little bit. We wrote down 100 grand, O Henry, Babe Ruth, and uh, Willow kind of clued in. We weren't sure, but he clued in on Heath Bar. So that's what we went with. Back in 1936, the name was an attempt to associate the elegant candy with a fashionable street here in New York City. It is the Fifth Avenue Bar. Oh, Fifth wow. Avenue. I've been to a bar on Fifth Avenue. I've never yeah. eaten the, the Fifth Avenue bar. We'll run down to the key, uh, the convenience store down the street and grab a few of those okay. for intermission. Known among Latin communities as a tool for disciplining children, a chancla, that's C-H-A-N-C-L-A, a chancla is a type of what object? Yeah, that's it, yeah. I just want to, I guess, I'm trying to think of something you would discipline children with other than a, uh, a squirt bottle. Um, I don't know that's a cat. I'm sorry. More of a dog thing, <laughs> cat or dog thing, yeah. I mean, I don't do that to children. Um, Anymore. I've seen it be effective. Yeah. Uh, and no one likes to be squirted with water. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you can go with that if you want. Okay. Yeah, All right, I'm cool. We're, that. we're locked in over here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was thinking this was some form of, like, stick or paddle. Tristan, I don't know what your thoughts are. Uh, I'm actually fairly certain that chancla is like a shoe or a slipper of some oh, sort that sounds right okay yeah, yeah let's let's go with uh, let's go with shoe okay that does seem that does seem right um 
Yes, I, I can totally see that, but uh, Willie, you can take it. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, we just we were on the same line as, as Jeff. We just said paddle. All right. I think one of you is getting credit for this one. Um, a chancla is a flip-flop or a slipper or some type of footwear. So, yeah, points for that. Thanks, wow. Tristan. Not a problem. Right points on the board. <laughs> So do all the drunk kids in college when they're it's like two in the morning and they're throwing flip flops at each other? They're really just throwing chanclas. That's what we're yeah, saying. That's pretty much <laughs> it. Depends. Straight uh, out of chancla. Fun fact, uh, in 2018 and 2019, uh, just to show you how uh, uh, integral the chancla is among many Latin communities uh, growing up, uh, minor league baseball team, the San Antonio Missions, briefly changed their name to the Flying Chanclas and had a <laughs> flying slipper. Excellent. Yeah, for uh, yeah, because that's how uh, intimidating they are for many people. Oh wait, there was a uh, there was a YouTube video of the lady throwing her her shoe all the way down the street to hit her daughter. That was <laughs> oh <laughs> yes, that was, I do remember that video. It was like half it was like half a football field away. She she nails it right now. <laughs> she goes down. That was a great video. Yeah, chanclas are very like prevalent in the in the meme community because I mean it's yeah that you can just really home in on people with uh, a slipper it's fantastic all right shoes are the universal language there you go many yeah. things there you go all right number four with a net worth of roughly 70 billion dollars uh, spanish businessman amancio ortega co-founded what flagship fast fashion retailer in 1975 uh, I just wrote down some that I thought are kind of fast and he sounds if he's rich then it's got to be a company that makes a lot of money I would think you want to you want to go with that? Yeah, um, I think the uh, the other ones might be too new. Too new. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of cool with going with that. Yeah. All right. So, cool. We're gonna lock in. Um, I was thinking for some reason, and I can't remember where it comes from, but H and M is one of the biggest like fast fashion companies. Um, I don't know if you know Armando Ortega at all, um, Tristan. I do not, and I was trying to think of something that was relatively new you know within the last uh 50 years or so and that's better than anything i've got so i'm totally cool with h&m yeah i can't remember where they're from but um i know the person who owns h&m is on the forbes list i don't know if it's armancio ortega or not but we'll go h&m sounds yeah, good yeah well and i had a, a nice little discussion uh ken and i both shop at h&m and forever 21 that was on our list uh and then the, the trifecta of gap old navy and banana republic i think they're all under the same umbrella but we kind of clued in on Banana Republic, we thought it's been around for a while. It's pretty high class. So that's what we went with, Banana Republic. All right, guys. Well, H&M was on the right track. Uh, H&M uh, stands for Hens and Moritz. It's a Swedish company. Mm. However, the Spanish fast fashion retailer, uh, I'm sure a lot of the female uh, listeners probably know already, it's Zara, Z-A-R-A, Zara. Mm. I should have known that's fast where... fashion. Yep. Yeah, I, I had sure. a I had a hunch on that one myself. So you get your underwear, or at least you said you got it there once. No, not underwear. Oh, I thought you did. No, I get outerwear. It's our. Oh, I see. Sometimes <laughs> I got a button-up shirt there once. I felt they, they got some nice like suit coats and stuff like that. But a lot of this stuff is way too wacky for me too, though. They do have some wacky stuff. Yep. A little flavor text for you. Uh, in January 2018, Forbes called Amancio Ortega the sixth wealthiest person in the world. It's number six on the list. Number five. A TV question for you. The fictional media conglomerate Waystar Royco is at the center of what TV series starring Brian Cox and his children, played by Karen Culkin, Sarah Snook, Alan Ruck, and Jeremy Strong? Finally, one I know. I can lock in for us if you want. Cool. We're, we're good. I I know the show, but I can't remember the name. It's the that HBO one that's all about um, how he's going to step down, and then he decides not to, and his kids are mad because they're trying to take over it, like Succession oh. or something. But I can't remember the name of it. Um, I do know what show you're talking about. Um, I don't it has know something to do with I don't know it has I'm something to do with like it. Family Legacy. I thought it was Succession or something. I, I've seen ads for it, but I haven't I haven't watched it. So we can go with Succession. I. Uh... I don't, I don't know that it very well could be right, but I don't know that I'm going to come up with anything else. Okay. Well, that's what we'll lock in with then. Succession. Ah, you piss me off, man. <laughs> Falling your way back into that one. Yeah, it's it's Succession. You guys are both right. It is Succession. Well done. Nice. All right. Well, after five questions, looks like the mild high comeback is a little bit behind with 10 points. Uh, Tristan and Jeff at It's Ragtime, 20 points. Okay. Sorry, due to the mild high, we're a bit slow. Yeah, yeah, we got to get acclimated to the uh, altitude, right? Yep. 
Number six. Commemorating the July Revolution of 1830, French artist Eugène Delacroix created a painting of a woman lifting the French flag among a crowd entitled, What? Leading the People. I mean, that word's pretty good. I was trying to think of a word for, you know how like the uh, you have the Union Jack, if there's a name for the French flag, but I, I honestly can't think of one right now at the top of my head. So I'm fine with going with that. Sure. Whichever, whichever one you're good with. Yeah. I can't remember if the French one is similar to the Italian one, but the Italian one is the tricolore, which is like the tricolor. Um, Makes sense. But um, do you know this one, Tristan? Uh, not immediately off the top of my head. I was just kind of uh, mulling around a couple words. I don't know if it was like translated from French and like now has an English title or something like that, but I was... I, uh, I presume this is the English title, yeah. I was thinking like maybe like freedom or liberty or something is just the kind of generic answers I, was, I came I was up with. Thinking something like that too. I was also thinking maybe like uh, people. It sounds a little bit redundant, but if if the revolution was towards more of like a democratic society, I could see that. I actually, um, yeah, I actually really kind of do like the the redundancy of that. I'm I'm cool with people. Okay. People leading uh, the people. Yeah, let's go people. Yeah, Willow and I. Um, had uh, 24,601 problems, uh, and this answer was one. That was a really deep Liam at Les reference, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Willow threw out some words down and uh, let you take it. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, was just taking the, the base context here, and I said, uh, you know, it might be like woman leading the people, uh, but I, I th- thought that even then uh, that might have been uh, slightly uh, too progressive. Uh, for the time so i just said resistance all right guys um i heard the word spoken at one point the french title is la liberté guidant le peuple it says liberty leading the people oh. Dang. it's a depiction of lady liberty uh leading the people ready for number seven yes absolutely yes. all right <clears throat> we're recording the song boy with love featuring halsey what group released the 2019 ep map of the soul persona becoming the first group since the Beatles to have three number one U.S. Billboard albums in less than a year. I think um, my love of pop music uh, is fitting in here nicely. I think we'll lock in if you're okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I'm a little out of my depths on this one, Tristan. What do you What do you think? Yeah, I don't know that I'm going to even pull any groups I don't. I, I know this isn't going to be right. The, the only thing I can think of is like Lucas Graham, even though I know his their their um, their hits weren't probably like two years ago. I'm not too sure. Better That's all I got, I got. Yeah, let's go with Lucas Graham. Yeah, so I'm not sure what answer Joe is going to accept. It could either be like the Bankton Boys, Bulletproof Boy Scouts, Bowden, <laughs> Shonen Dan, Bankton, Sony and Don. But I believe for most people, it's BTS. Yep, all those answers are acceptable. Is BTS uh, a little flavor They're text? They're unacceptable you. and unnecessary. <laughs> you're, uh, you're, you're really earning that recent review, Neil. Yep. <laughs> Some info yep. for you. Uh, researchers estimated that BTS's annual production inducement effects, which means the economic value for related to, to added to the related industry for South Korea, it totals about three point six billion dollars annually which is equivalent to 26 mid-sized South Korean companies. So they are huge for That's South true. Korea. That is absurd. Yeah. Are they the biggest band in the world right now? They they very well they? They yeah. could be. It's a K-pop group, a BTS. They oh. are, I, mean, yeah, I assumed it was them because there's no way any American act put out three right. albums this year. They're breaking a ton of barriers. I mean, I think they're the first K-pop act on billboard awards like an american televised event or they're on snl too so they're really uh here's a fun uh fun fact for you jbtv which i work for mm-hmm. had their first uh, american television appearance bts mm. yes oh nice okay here's a sports question for you guys under the current nfl rules what is the largest number of points a team can win by in a game that goes to overtime I don't think it's fair to ask an NFL rules question, seeing as the officials don't even know what the NFL rules are, right? Most of the time. That's true. Well, at least they can't see what's going on. I think, um, Willow, it was kind of, we're on the same wavelength there. I, I was thinking of the way the question's worded, and I think you're right. Okay. Let's, let's go with that. Okay. I have an idea. I'm assuming under current NFL rules, 
like it's not a sudden death thing i'm pretty sure it's not a sudden death thing i think Um, the way it works is um the first team uh to possess the ball can win if they get a touchdown now they won't get the extra point so they'll only get six if the first team who possesses it gets a three point the other team gets a chance to respond so even if they came back and got a touchdown they would only be up by six so i i don't know if it was six sound right to you or if it were like a sudden death thing i was thinking that it it was kind of like uh you had a chance to score the touchdown you could either kick the field goal or, or go for the conversion and then there was another possession by the other team in which case you could get a safety on top of that, which would bring the total, I believe, to 11. So I'm either thinking 6 or 11 okay. as far as the did, most points go. Did they change the, the rules on that from last season? I or... am the worst guy to ask, i, okay. I got to tell you. Because <laughs> for whatever reason, I was thinking like both teams would have a chance to possess, but only if the first team got a field goal. Um but I was thinking a touchdown closed it out, if I remember right. Um, you very well could be right. It, okay. it might you, it, it, it might be kind of like a, a trick in that facet. It very well could be six. Okay. Are you okay if we go with six? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, we'll go with six. Yeah, so we uh, we were on the uh, thinking the same thing. Um, I, I'm not a big sports guy at all, so um, um, I just kind of went with the first number that popped into my head. I didn't think that you'd be able to score the extra point. Um, and I knew that, um, um, you know, six points is kind of the standard number of points you get for whatever it is you make in football. Uh, so we went with six. All right, guys. I admit this one is very tricky. Uh, both of you understood that uh, under the current NFL rules, it's no longer sudden death. So this is how the situation would turn out. The team that receives the ball first would kick a, t- would kick a field goal for three points. On the next possession, when they kick off, the d- the team that has the lead would play on defense they would have to return a touchdown for six points there's no extra point kicked so the final score would be a margin of nine points the most you can win by is a nine points in overtime mm. it, I, oh. I mean, it's very tricky i think we had this at a sports trivia night it was really tough um but i thought it was just a kooky uh thing i don't believe it's ever happened but that is the most the team can win by uh if a game goes to overtime all right, guys, ready for number nine? Mm-hmm. Okay. What founding father of colonial America represented the British soldiers involved in the Boston Massacre of 1770 as an attorney? I think we have a, a line on something. This is definitely a Ken question. I would have turned to him. Um, I think I know it. But I, I have an idea. Um, you're okay with that? Yeah. Okay. I'm I just, okay with that. I know the family, so I'm just guessing. But okay, we're locked in. <laughs> like personally? <laughs> Uh, Tristan, uh, my initial reaction goes to John Adams because he was an attorney. Um, does that sound right to you? Yeah, I, I think so as well. I, but I think like a lot of the founding fathers were attorneys, weren't they? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I, so I was just like initially just writing them down. I realized I was just writing all of them. So, uh, yeah, uh, John Adams is totally cool with me. Yeah. George Washington was more of like an industrialist than than an attorney yeah um, yeah not 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 george washington jefferson I was, think he was also in the military wasn't he yeah he yep. well later yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean before before the, the course, war came on yeah I'm just a ribbon yeah yeah i got gotcha. you um Wait, jefferson, jefferson wasn't jefferson was <sighs> now did he move on up to uh military <laughs> at some point or <laughs> no he liked to uh spend his time hanging out in france although um he was from virginia so i don't know if he would have been up there at that time um uh so just yeah. just another consideration um so I, yeah john adams is the one that i i kind of had a gut reaction to so if you like that i think we're good to go with john adams i like yeah it. for listeners of the podcast this is my thinking and willow agreed um Anthony Hopkins was John Quincy Adams, who was on, I believe, the Supreme Court, and his father was John Adams, uh, who I thought of as Paul Giamatti, and I knew he was a lawyer as well, so that's what we went with, was John Adams. <laughs> all right, points all around, guys. It is John Adams. I have a AKA question, Paul Giamatti. I think, I think a large portion of that miniseries with Paul Giamatti actually focused on that, too. That's I, didn't, what I, just, I didn't see it, but I think my dad was watching it, and I 
happened across it. Yeah, I remember the trailer. That's why I, I, I thought of him and then the trailer of like people going ang- being angry about it. And I was like, oh, maybe that's what it is. So, uh, yeah. Neil, are things not real to you unless they've happened in film or television? That's correct. <laughs> I don't know. I took a, I took a red pill and that's what it said. So, uh, John Adams said uh, he believed that it was vital that the British soldiers and their captain received fair trials. Um, he believed that the cause for self-government would be damaged if Boston justice was turned out to be little more than lynch law. So that's why he reluctantly but accepted the position to represent the British soldiers. Number 10. Let's do it. All right. Native to South America. What close relative to the guinea pig with an eight-letter name from the Tupi language, meaning grass eater, is the largest living rodent on Earth? I've got this. We can lock I've, in. Perfect. So do I. Um, so it's not the thing from Princess Bride, is it? Oh, I, that's that's a good reference. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure. Of unusual size. Uh, the rouse. That sucks because if it was like any other animal, not any other animal, I yeah, I do really well with like snakes and insects and um, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I know I can picture it, but I can't put a name to it. Again, I couldn't um, pull an eight-letter name unless you do. You have one? You think? No. Or? Uh, do you just want to do this as a joke answer? Yeah, sure. That sounds good. All right, all right. Our team is locked in. All right, Tristan. What did you think this was? I have the capybara, which is C A P Y B A R A, or eight hey, letters. Joe, can you do me a favor? Uh, what did you say that they're named after? It's a name from the Tupi language, meaning grass eater. Okay. Um, if I also thought it was a capybara, and the reason I think this is so funny is because they're actually more famously known for being coprophages, which means their digestive system is bad. And they end up re-eating their own waste. Um, but I think this is the capybara. <laughs> That's a gross little fact that you threw in there. <laughs> is that why you always spend extra time in the bathroom to be more efficient um, with your energy? Uh, I'll let Willow Humans take it. don't need to do that, Neil. <laughs> well, no one told me. Um, yeah, I'm really, really upset that I didn't pull that because, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, we, uh, we just went with Master Splinter. <laughs> he's a that large rodent that's a big rat all right well the answer is and correctly spelled as well is the capybara well done all right that brings an end to round one looks like uh neil and willow as mild high comeback are still looking for their comeback because they have 30 points uh meanwhile on the other side of it's ragtime they have 40 points so not a bad showing in round one yeah, we're still in it here comes the swing rounds um let you know something about myself. Uh, One of my favorite parts of watching movies is when a character in the movie says the name of the movie in the movie. (laughs) Is there what's called title drops, where a character (laughs) says the name in the movie in the movie. So this swing round is all about notable title drops in my mind. Uh, I'm going to give you a year. I may give you the character's name. I may not. I may give you the number of words. I may not. But I won't give you a Google quotes, and I'm going to exclude the name of the movie, and you have to figure out what the name of the movie is. Ready to go? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, I do love this. It's an inside joke with many of our friends, because uh, we cheer when they say the name. And it reminds me, if anyone watches Barry, which is a great show, uh, he has an audition for a movie called Swim Instructors, and Henry Winkler, who is his acting coach, uh, is, is beside himself, because he goes, I can't believe this. You say the title of the movie, which means they can't cut you. So, <laughs> uh, yes, we're, we're ready. All right. Here comes number one. The year was 2006. The character's name is John Cutter. That's why every magic trick has a third act. The hardest part. The part we call. And then finish the quote. Number two. The year is 1998. President. I address you tonight not as the president of the United States, not as the leader of a country, but as a citizen of humanity, we are faced with the very gravest of challenges. The Bible calls this day blank. Question number three. The year is 1974. Character's name is Walsh. Forget it, Jake. It's <laughs> blank. Number four. Uh, it's a little bit of dialogue here. 1998. Sue Young's driver. Is there a problem, officer? Sang. No problem, just... And then finish the quote. 2006. The character's name is Paula. Look, many young men who should be able to move out simply can't. It's called blank, blank, blank. And that's where I come in. 
Young men develop self-esteem best during a romantic relationship, so I simulate one. Number six, the year's 1995. I'm going to not say the character's name because I think it'll give it away, but I'll give you the quote. Everything I think and everything I do is wrong. I was wrong about Elton. I was wrong about Christian. And now Josh hates me. It all boiled down to one inevitable conclusion. I was just totally blank. It's one word. Number seven. The year's 2007. Dialogue here. Pam, are you sure it's safe? Stuntman Mike, it's better than safe. It's... Finish the quote. Number eight. The character is Will Hayes. Speaking to April. Will Hayes. Because the first time I saw that, that I saw these hands, I couldn't imagine not being able to hold them. But mainly, when you love somebody as someone as much as I love you, getting married is the only thing left to do. So will you marry me? April. Blank. Blank. Two words. Number nine. The year is 2010. The narrator is speaking. Let's be honest. We all want to be superstars and hotshots, but guess what? That the people that do the real work, the ones that make the difference, you don't see them on TV or on the front page. I'm talking about the day in, day outers, the grinders. Come on, man. You know who I'm talking about. Finish the quotes. And I will give you a hint. The narrator is voiced by Ice T. And number 10, the year is 1999. Electra King. I could have given you the world. James Bond. Finish the quote. Mm hmm. All right, so while everybody mulls over that answer, Jeff, uh, can you tell us really quickly how uh, our listeners can join our three guests today on Patreon? It's very easy. All you have to do is go to patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast. Although if you need a reason, there's many. Uh, all you have to do is just check out our perks there. We've got a lot of great things, including bonus episodes, signed posters that we ship out. Um, so basically, if you're interested in supporting us at any level, there's really great perks for you there. So again, physical treasures, really. Indeed. We Things just, you can cherish for a lifetime. And we just shipped out Tristan's poster. Will got his poster today. His box will be shipped out Hand soon. Hand delivered. Hand delivered. I mean, you, you know, got to make it here. We don't We don't come to you. But <laughs> those, those perks and many more, patreon.com slash triviality podcast. All right. And uh, let's go ahead and recap the swing round and get the answers. All right. All right, guys, for question number one, the quote was from 2006 by a character named John Cutter. That's why every match trick has a third act. The hardest part, the part we call. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was pretty sure this one um, starts with the pledge, and then you have the turn, and it ends with the prestige. So we said the prestige. You, you lot magic there. You lot the prestige. Uh, we went with the prestige with the Christian Bale and uh, the Hugh Jackman. And the Michael Caine. And the Michael Caine. And uh, David Bowie. <laughs> it is the prestige. Well done, guys. And well done on the impressions as well. <laughs> Much appreciated. Number two, 1998, President, I address you not tonight. I address you tonight not as the President of the United States, not as the leader of the country, but as a citizen of humanity. We are faced with the gravest of challenges the Bible calls this day. I thought it was Independence Day because I remember him giving that long speech. Um, yeah. The biblical Independence Day. Well, yeah, the, the, exactly. So, and, and then I thought, given uh, biblical connotations, we thought maybe it was Judgment Day for Terminator. So we went Judgment Day. Ooh, about six years too late on that one. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, we we both thought that it was uh, Independence Day for a second, and then you know, we uh, I think we settled on uh, Armageddon. Ooh, the Bible calls this day Armageddon. All right, number three. One more fa most famous title drops of all time, 1974. Walsh says, forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. So we went Chinatown. We also went Chinatown. It is Chinatown. Nice job. Uh, number four, 1998. Sue Young's driver. Is there a problem, officer? Sang. No problem. Just. This one uh, is uh, Rush Hour. <laughs> <laughs> so we said Rush Hour. Yeah, this one was interesting. Uh, I was having a little bit of trouble with it, and I was looking at the year and uh, the name Sue Young, and I was just thinking about you know all the all the movies Joe chose are pretty big movies, uh, and I was trying to think what would be uh, a sort of a major uh, Asian character in 1998, and I was like, oh, Rush Hour, and with the driving, and it kind of all came together. So we went with Rush Hour. Yep, it is Rush Hour. Uh, the Sang is the villain. Sue Young is the daughter of the Chinese consul who gets kidnapped. Why? And everything that happens is during rush hour. 
All right, number five, 2006. Paula says, look, many young men who should be able to move out simply can't. It's called blank, blank, blank. Uh, yeah, this one um, we didn't know, and we were, we were really, like, raking ourselves over the coals. But uh, Willow has a, a, an answer we thought fit uh, pretty nicely. The diving bell and the butterfly? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Is that old lady trying to seduce you again, Neil? <laughs> No, I should return to that well if she's still alive. I don't know. (laughs) What's wrong with you? (laughs) And uh, I I think Tristan bailed me out on this one. Man's paralyzed in that movie. (laughs) Doesn't mean he can't find love. Yeah. Uh, So (laughs) I'm very thankful to Tristan. Uh, Tristan, what did we say for this one? Yeah, this one um, is one of my personal favorite rom-coms. I remember watching it with my grandmother when I was probably around 18 or 19. And... uh, I made the comment, I really love this movie, and she's like, why? It was essentially written about you, and uh, that is failure <laughs> to want. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is that with McConaughey, right? And yeah. Terry Bradshaw? Yeah, Sarah Jessica Parker. Sarah oh. Jessica Parker as the character Paula and failure yeah. to launch. You were nice only job. 18. Your grandma's already calling you out on, on living at home? <laughs> Jesus. We, yeah, it was, uh, well, I mean, it's a it's a moot point now, but at the time, you know, she hit the nail on the head. I can't blame her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number six, 1995. I withheld the name of the character because I thought it was a giveaway. Uh, everything I think and everything I do is wrong. I was wrong about Elton. I was wrong about Christian. And now Josh hates me. It all boils down to one inevitable conclusion. I was just totally... Oh my god, I just figured uh, it out. <laughs> I just figured it out. Uh, yeah, we're going to go with uh, Clueless. Oh, I hate you so much. But we got one on the end, so I'm going to let you have it. Uh, Tristan, what was our answer for this one? Uh, I just wrote down the word alone. I was totally alone. I had nothing else. <laughs> There's been a lot of buzzer beaters in this yeah. uh, swing round. Yep, at the very last second, spoken by Cher, played by Alicia Silverstone, it is Clueless. Sorry, I just, when he said it that last time, it clicked finally. 2007, Pam, are you sure it's safe? Stuntman Mike, it's better than safe. It's Chinatown. (laughs) (laughs) I would say that's better than safe. Uh, You went with uh, Death Proof. I was racking my brain for a little while on this one. I was like, it sounds really familiar. And I was like, Stuntman Mike, why why would the character's name be Stuntman Mike? And I was like... Because it's written by a total weirdo. And I was like, it's got to be a movie written by a total weirdo. And then I remember Ken and I went to see a midnight showing of a 2007 film when we were the only two people there for about the first hour and a half. Uh, and it was Grindhouse. So I'm pretty sure this one's Death Proof. <laughs> yep. It's one of my favorite ones on this list. It is Death Proof, the Tarantino joint Death Proof. Nice job. Which you would have caught if you you, you showed up an hour and a half into the film. Right. So <laughs> there's no way to there's no way to tell that he likes feet in that movie. That's for no. sure. <laughs> no no foot shots whatsoever. All right, number eight, two thousand eight. Uh, I think this one might have been the toughest one. Uh, Will Hayes um, proposes. Uh, will you? So will you marry me? And April responds. Uh, yeah, it, it was actually, it was not tough at all. It was totally easy. It was, uh, will you marry me? And then she says, um, Edward Scissorhands. <laughs> uh, this one was a really deep poll for me. Uh, Colleen and I watch this one all the time. Uh, it's one of my favorite Ryan Reynolds performances. And uh, it's on Netflix right now, as I mentioned uh, in the discussion. But I'm pretty sure it is definitely maybe. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Ryan Reynolds asks Isla Fisher. Will you marry me? And Isla Fisher says, definitely, maybe. Uh, number nine, uh, 2010. Another tough one, I think. But uh, hopefully the iced tea hint gave you gave it to you. Talking about the day in, day outers, the grinders. Come on, man. You know what I'm talking about. It's the other guys. Maybe. Yeah, I don't think we had an answer for this one. I, uh, I was really trying to hear iced tea say this in my head, but uh, we, uh, we don't know. It was the other guys. Nice job. All right, and number 10, 1999. I think this one might be my favorite one of this list. Uh, Electric King, I could have given you the world, to which James Bond responds. The world is not enough. Yeah, fair enough. The world is not enough. The answer is the world is not enough. Nice job, guys. Well done on that round. Following the swing round, it looks like the Mild High comeback did make a comeback because they got 45 points out of that. On the other side, uh, milking 30 points out of the swing round is it's ragtime. So the uh, point totals are 75 for Mild High Comeback and 70 for it's ragtime. All right. 
Here comes question number one, music question. What month and year, so I need a month and a year, appear in the title of a 1975 hit song for the four seasons with the parenthetical title, mm-hmm. Oh, What a Night. We can lock it. Great. Uh, okay, so, Oh, What a Night, ding, 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 late December in 63, right? December 63? We did, I think. Late December in the 63. No, no, and no, no, me. It rhymes with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going to like it with December 63. December 1963. It is December 1963. Nice job, guys. I'll give you a fun fact about this. Uh, according to Bob Gaudio, the one of the group members, the song's lyrics was supposed to be set in 1933 with the title December 5th, 1933 to celebrate the re- repeal of Prohibition. Oh, yeah. I did not. Know uh, that. Yep, they wanted it. Uh, Frankie Valley urged him to change it, along with uh, Judy Parker, uh, to talk about the time Gaudio and Judy um, first met. Right over number two, the alma mater of basketball players like Kyle Korver and Doug McDermott, Creighton University is a Jesuit university located in what U.S. state? Creighton University. Anything on this one? Yeah, I mean that's fine with me. I because I have no idea, and that seems kind of right. How good are you with this kind of stuff? Uh, I The only uh, cue I took was from Jesuit, and I said Utah, and uh, that has nothing behind it. Yeah, um, I'm fine going with Utah. Um, then for uh, no reason at all, we just said North Carolina. All right, guys. Uh, Creighton University is located in Omaha, Nebraska. Nebraska is the correct answer. Yep. Omaha Styley for you 311 mm-hmm. fans. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ready for number three? Mm-hmm. Okay. In Greek mythology, the ninth of Hercules' Hercules's 12 labors was to obtain what item of clothing from Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazons? This article of clothing signified her authority as queen. God, Ken, is, Ken has been so, talking about learning these for years. So me and Jeff uh, did a uh, late night cram session one time on the Herculean labors, I think, before uh, Geek Bowl, because it always comes up. Did not come up in uh, Geek Bowl. But now we're going to see what Jeff remembers. Not enough. From that cram session. Um, yeah, I mean, whichever, maybe the the first one? Yeah, let's go with the first one. Okay. Do you, I mean, do you think it's like a robe or a tiara of some sort? It's the only thing I got. I'm trying to remember. There's one with a rope, but I know that's not this. I'm pretty sure. Oh, maybe um, it's like a like a cord, like you know, like a, a belt, a sash of some sort. Maybe. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of like killing subquests. That's like six of them. And Doesn't then, he like also clean out the stables or something like that? Yeah, by redirecting the rivers and flooding it out. Um, yeah, does does little housework. Yeah. Um, yeah, you want to go with a rope? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I mean, Wonder Woman was an Amazon, and she had a famous rope lasso. So. You are telling the truth, Jeff. Um, I'll let uh, Willow take it because we were having a little trouble here. I wrote down Golden Fleece, but I believe that's, uh, I can never remember if it's um, Pericles it's, or... Uh, Jason and the... Jason and the Argonauts. Uh, Argonauts, right. yeah. Um, and uh, I, I tossed a couple of things around. Um, I know that uh, the uh, Amazons aren't really known for wearing headwear, so I kind of tossed the crown or headdress out of the um, equation. Um, I thought that maybe it would be um, like a... Um, um, like a top piece or, you know, like pants or something like that. But um, I have a feeling um, it's um, a bracelet or like, um, you know, a gauntlet or something that you put put on your arm. All right, guys. The answer I was looking for, uh, ninth of Hercules' 12 labors, was to obtain the girdle or belt of Hippolyta. Ooh. Ready for number four? Yes. What single word appears in the titles of all three published books written by Kevin Kwan. One of these books was made into a 2018 movie. So I'm looking for a single word and appears in titles of three, all three published books by Kevin Kwan. Okay, so it's either one of these three words. Oh, I got it now. I just don't know what the book books are called. Um, do you want to go with that? Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, we're locked in. Okay. I feel, uh, was Ready Player One a, a trilogy series? I'm trying to think of trilogies that launched in 2018. Do you want to just guess like a generic word that's in a bunch of novels, like time or something like that? Sure. I like that. I like the vaguest approach. 
Okay. Time. Yeah, this one, um, I thought about it 2018, and uh, I remembered, I believe, the, the trilogy of books is Crazy Rich Asians. Um, and we were trying to decide which, I don't know the names of the other books. I know they're making a sequel. And uh, Will and I were going back and forth between Rich, which I believe they are in all the books, or Asians. And we thought it's a trilogy by an Asian author about uh, Asian families. So we thought that Asians would be the word that would go across all three books. All right. Well, Kevin Kwan, born in Singapore, wrote the, the trilogy, starting with Crazy Rich Asians, followed by China Rich Girlfriend and Rich People Problems. The word was rich. Sorry, man. So close. It's all right. Willow said rich, and I, I didn't know. So I, that, was, that was the word that I thought for sure it wasn't. Was rich. rich yeah. uh, me too. That's why I, I just, oh, sorry, man. You had it. It's all right. All right. Number five. If today is Tuesday... And seven days from today is also Tuesday. On what day of the week would a hundred days from today be? That's what you got? Mm-hmm. All right, cool. We're locked in. I think it's Thursday, 98 divisible by seven. Two days after 98 to, would be 100. So two days after Tuesday is Thursday. Perfect. That's what I thought as well. Uh, yeah, um, through um, the same math because there's no other way. We also got Thursday. That's correct, guys. Well, well done. Yep. After five questions in round two, both teams gained 20 more points, bringing it to 95 to 90 with mild high comeback with a slight advantage. Question number six in this round. According to the U.S. Census, which of the five New York City boroughs is the most populous? Yeah, I recently found out that Manhattan is the third most populated island in the U.S. after Puerto Rico and Long Island. And Long Island contains two of the boroughs, Queens and the Bronx, I want to say. Mm-hmm. I think it's Queens. I'm cool with Queens, absolutely. We're going to lock in with Queens. Yeah, um, Will and I were thinking it was either Staten Island or Queens. Um, so if it's not one of them, it's probably the other, because we thought Manhattan is sort of a trick. Um, but uh, we thought, because it is sparsely populated, as Jeff said, there might be more area. Uh, we actually went with Staten Island. All right, guys. Well, Manhattan is third with about 1.6 million. Uh, the one that's most populous with over 2.6 million, which would be, which is more than the fourth most populous city of Houston, uh, it is Brooklyn. Oh, Brooklyn wow. has the most. Yep. All right. No points on that one. Let's move mm-hmm. on to question seven. Number seven. What word that can be found in the scientific name of Lou Gehrig's disease is defined as abnormal stiffening or hardening of body tissue? We're good. Okay, good. Um, so they're locked in. So you wrote down rigor mortis. Uh, yeah. I believe that's only after you die, though. It is, uh, but I think it's it's one of those words because that's um, like your, um, you know, your body stiffens up. So because um, Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease, I believe, is ALS, and uh, I'm not sure what the AL or S stand for. Syndrome is probably the S, I'm guessing, but AL is um, auto, maybe autoimmune something. Maybe it's the L. I don't know. But if you, I, I have no idea what that stands for. So if you want to go with rigor mortis. Um, I, I wasn't thinking the whole word rigor mortis. I was just thinking like one of them. Oh, like rigor? Rigor. I think because I, I think mortis, mortis is, is death. So I think maybe. Oh, rigor, rigor after death. Yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and lock in with that. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, so the the first thing that came to mind is, I, and I can't remember how to pronounce the first word. Um, I think it's amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Mm-hmm. And sclerosis is like, so like arterial sclerosis would be like a hardening of like heart vessels. Um, so I think the word we're looking for is sclerosis. I don't know how you feel about that, Tristan. I like it. I like it a lot. Okay, we'll lock that in. All right. Yep. Jeff was dead on. It's sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is the correct answer. Nice job. Number eight, an Academy Award nominee for the 1977 movie The Turning Point, who had a recurring role as Alexander Petrovsky, Carrie Bradshaw's love interest in the final season of Sex in the City. I've seen all of Sex in the City. And I will lock this in. Um, do you know this one, Tristan? I have not seen any of Sex in the City. And I could be wrong. I mean, it, maybe it's not Mr. Big, but that's the only character I can think of. Um, so locking in with Mr. Big. <laughs> we're going to say Mr. Big. All right. Uh, um, so during his prime in real life, uh, he was known as the Michael Jordan of ballet. And that would be Mikhail Baryshnikov. Ooh. That's right. Yep. Uh, the Turning Point is a movie about ballet. 
and the final season saw Mikhail Baryshnikov as Carrie Bradshaw's love interest. Well done. Very moody boyfriend on his arc. Very moody. Similar to Foundation, but thicker, what cosmetic used to mask dark circles, age spots, and other small blemishes comes in liquid, stick, cream, and pencil varieties? Willow uh, had his finger on the trigger immediately, so we're going to lock in. All right, Tristan, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, my immediate thought is concealer, right? Uh, that was what I was thinking. kind of throwing me off, but concealer. Yeah, the other, ones, the other ones seem to make sense. I thought concealer as well, so I'm good to go with that. Let's do it. Fairly certain this is uh, concealer as well from my, uh, my days doing drag. Yep. Well, yeah, the pencil variety isn't very common, but I would accept it either color corrector or concealer. Nice job. Nice. Did you have points. a drag name? Uh, Willow was my drag name. Oh, um, nice. I have a, a different legal name, and um, so I ended up going by Willow. Well, cool. It's a cool name. So I right right kept it. Okay. Final question. Pronounce the same. What homophonic pair of words refers to an adjective, meaning very strange or unusual, and a noun referring to a type of marketplace often associated with the Middle East? All right, so uh, we didn't really discuss, but correct me if I'm wrong, Tristan. This also shares its name in part with a 1995 song by OMC. <laughs> <laughs> How bizarre. Um, well, I, I was not familiar with the song, but bizarre is what I had as well. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We're going to go with bizarre. Um, yeah, uh, we, we had the same thing. Yep. How bizarre. Well done. It's spelled B-I-Z-A-R-R-E or the marketplace B-A-Z-A-A-R. Nice job. Mm-hmm. Strong finish strong. from both of you guys. Well done. Yeah, strong finish, man. Great job. All right. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like uh, Mile High Comeback did make a comeback in this game, ending with 125, and it's ragtime, ending with 120, going into the final round. Okay. Ready for the final round? I'll give you your uh, categories. Um, number one is The Pen is Mightier. Number two is An Album Cover. <laughs> Number three is things you shouldn't put in your mouth. Number four is catch these men. How dare you, Joe? Bring this filth onto our show. uh, Colors that are red. Looks like our teams had a pretty easy time determining their wagers as um, the mild high comeback went Oakland 5 all the way down and uh, it's ragtime did 10s all the way down. So... Uh, it'll be an interesting uh, interesting uh, final round here. So uh, without further ado, let's get the questions from Joe. Okay. Question number one, the category is the pen is mightier. The phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword, is said to be coined by British author Edward Bulwer-Lytton in his play named after what French clergyman and minister to King Louis Thirteenth. This religious official is depicted as a villain in the novel The Three Musketeers. Number two, an album cover. On the famous album cover for the 1969 Beatles album Abbey Road, which one of the Beatles was walking barefoot? Number three, things you shouldn't put in your mouth. Found in the seeds and pits of apricots, apples, peaches, and plums, amygdalin is a chemical compound that, when ingested by humans, can release what toxin? Number four, catch these men. During the weekend of St. Patrick's Day, 1990, two men with fake police uniforms stole 13 artworks valued at a combined total of $500 million at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in what city? None of these suspects have been caught, and no works have yet to be recovered. And number five, colors that are red. The CMYK color model is used for color printing features four ink colors, cyan, yellow, key black, and what shade of red? While we're answering the questions, just wanted to remind everyone to come join us over at The Crop. Uh, We're just about at 500 members. We'd love to see you over there to interact with all the other listeners of the show. And a special shout out today um, to a listener. Uh, it's a, a personal friend of ours. Uh, Adam Abassi was on the show, but his sister, Tess Abassi, I know you listen at work with a bunch of your coworkers. Just wanted to give you a shout out and a congratulations to your uh, marriage uh, this, uh, this fall. So congratulations and thank you for listening and spreading the show around work. We appreciate it. Yeah, and after a brief discussion, I think all the answers are locked in. So 
Sure. Number one, the pen is mightier. The phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword, is said to be coined by British author Edward Bulward Lytton in his play named for what? French clergyman and minister to King Louis XIII also appears in The Three Musketeers. Uh, yeah, so for our team, uh, Mild High Comeback, um, I knew the play was Cardinal Richelieu. Uh, I could not remember if that was, I mean, obviously, I guess it is the name of the villain in Three Musketeers. I just remember Tim Curry as the villain in Three Musketeers, but I knew that was the name of the play, and I was hoping that would be enough to get us the point. So he said Cardinal Richelieu. You butcher the French. <laughs> Apparently, I just need to watch movies because that's where all knowledge comes from. Um, we didn't know, um, having wager 10, we said Robespierre. It is, in fact, Cardinal Richelieu. Number two, an album cover on the famous album cover of the 1969 Beatles album Abbey Road, which one of the Beatles was walking barefoot. Um, yeah, we, uh, we went ahead and said Paul McCartney. Uh, we, we both thought, Tristan and I both thought it was John Lennon pretty quickly, so we said John Lennon. The subject of a uh, conspiracy theory, thinking that he was dead, it was Paul Ooh. McCartney. Yep. Yep. Number three. Things you shouldn't put in your mouth. Found the seeds and pits of apricots, apples, peaches, and plums. Amygdalin is the chemical compound that, when ingested by humans, can release what toxin? Um, yeah, so um, this is one of my favorite facts of all time. Um, this is uh, cyanide, and I'm pretty sure you can also acquire it by boiling the seeds. Um, it's not It's not going to be toxic until you eat uh like several pounds of them and at that point you're probably gonna die from eating several pounds of seeds <laughs> it'll be great fiber content but uh we <laughs> we said cyanide as well it is cyanide nice job guys uh number four catch these men during the weekend of saint patrick's day 1990 two men with fake police uniforms stole 13 works of art valued at a combined total of 500 million from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in what city? This one, I believe it, it jogged my memory from a question I may have written, possibly. And um, I do remember the the scandal. And for some reason, Boston came to me. And I, I'm not 100% sure, but that's what we locked in with was Boston. And uh, we didn't really have a good line on this either. But what do we go with, Tristan? Uh, Boston as well. It is, in fact, Boston. Nice job. All right. Number five colors that are red the cmyk color model used for color printing features four ink colors cyan yellow key black and what shade of red i had some deliberation about this in my own head um whether it was uh maroon or uh magenta but um, i think we ended up just going with magenta it was we also said magenta it is in fact magenta nice job well that's the conclusion of the game Looks like it's ragtime netted uh, 10 extra points in that final round with 130. But uh, sweeping the final round uh, questions is mild high comeback. They ended up with 150, and they are today's cream of the crop. I am the cream. Great job, man. You really saved us on the, the last, like, seven, eight questions. You really kind of came alive there in the comeback. Oh, yeah, well you. done, guys. Yeah, Neil put you ahead during the swing round, which is all movie-based. So, I mean, if he let you down there, that would have been a real disappointment. But uh, congratulations. <laughs> I am to be a disappointment in every other facet of my life, but not today. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, great game, man. We appreciate it. Great game to, to you as well, Tristan. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, well done to both of you gentlemen as well. Yeah, sorry we couldn't uh, pull out a win, but, you know, we lost honorably. So Absolutely. It was still fun. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, close games are... I mean, that that's a win in its own right, you know. <laughs> yeah, Joe, thank you very much for hosting. This was a great game. Um, it was it was tough at the beginning. I think our contestants learned a lot. And then uh, second round, uh, they actually racked up some points and a lot of fun with the swing round, too. Absolutely. Awesome. Yep. My, my pleasure, guys. It's uh, yeah, yep. super fun to write these questions for you guys. Hopefully you guys enjoyed them and hope everyone that was listening enjoyed them. Yeah, you're welcome back anytime. And, of course, our other guests... Tristan and Willow are welcome back anytime. Thank you so much for joining us as well. And thank Thanks, you man. all for being uh, Patreon supporters. It means a lot to us and it helps us run the show. And uh, that'll conclude today's uh, episode uh, for Willow, Tristan, Joe, and my co host, Neil, Jeff. I am Ken, and that was Triviality. either girdle or belt i'm reluctant to give uh rope as a correct answer um 
Because it's wrong. I don't know. That's what are your feelings? <laughs> it's, it's I wrote a no, cord. That, that's yeah. That's very wrong. Jeff uh, <laughs> used a rope once as a belt when he was alive during the uh, Dust Bowl, but. Uh, and I expect one day Jeff will use a belt as a rope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I put food. I put food in the dog bowl. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs>